Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for jo joining us today. We're going to enjoy a virtual lunchtime lecture from the John Fitzgerald Kennedy National Historic Site. Uh, the, the lecture, the presentation is entitled From Beale Street to the White House. We're going to receive a virtual tour of JFK's birthplace on 83 Beale Street, as well as an exploration of his boyhood neighborhood, including the second home in which the Kennedys lived, their family church, and the school where a young John F. Kennedy received some of his earliest education. We're also going to learn about his mother, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, uh, how she managed a large family. We're going to discover a collection of items such as JFK's favorite childhood books, and we're going to explore the influences that shaped him as a child. And we're going to do all this in 60 minutes. Uh, so today's program is led by lead park ranger Gabby Horn. And uh, so all uh, 200 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Gabby for joining us today. And Gabby, you can take it away. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, well, as you just said, and I want to introduce myself, I suppose myself, uh, my name is Gabby Hornbeck, and I serve as the lead park ranger at John Fitzgerald Kennedy National Historic Site, which is the home uh, where President Kennedy was born on May 29th, 1917, and it is in Brookline, Massachusetts. So as Robert also said, today we'll be embarking on a virtual tour of the birthplace home at 83 Beale Street, as well as an exploration of his boyhood neighborhood, including the second home in which the Kennedys lived, their family church, and the school where a young John F. Kennedy received some of his earliest education. And through this, I hope you'll get a sense that John F. Kennedy's relationships with his parents and his siblings, as well as the influences of growing up in Brookline during his formative years, were extremely influential upon aspects of his character. And these experiences really have parallels in his adult life and ultimately uh, his life as president of the United States. So before diving deeper uh, into this subject, however, I do want to give you some context about John Fitzgerald Kennedy National Historic Site in relation to other national park sites in the area, as well as the National Park Service as a whole, um, as it can sometimes surprise people that a house museum is a unit of the National Park Service. Um, we are a part of a consortium of three sites in our area, um, which I believe you've already heard from if you've been um, participating in this series with, in previous weeks. Uh, so those sites are John Fitzgerald Kennedy National Historic Site, Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site, also in Brookline, and Longfellow House Washington's Headquarters National Historic Site in Cambridge. So although we have different historical figures and eras which we discuss, um, our management and frontline staff overlap and work together in many ways, and our site themes are encapsulated by the unifying idea of shaping the nation through parks, poetry, and public service. So if you're in the area, I encourage you to come and visit our three sites as we reopen for our seasons um, beginning in spring or summer, depending upon the site. Uh, additionally, as you may be familiar with um, through this series, we are, as I said, a unit of the National Park Service. Uh, displayed here are different National Park Service sites throughout Massachusetts. Um, John Fitzgerald Kennedy National Historic Site is currently the third smallest National Park Service site of all the units in the agency at about 0 0.09 acres, um, but we experience significant visitation throughout the year, uh, particularly during our typical open season. As of 2018, we had an annual visitation of about 25,000 people uh, for all over the country, from all over the country and the world, um, which really indicates the resonance of the history and memory of President Kennedy to many through today. So this leads me to the question that I'd like to really start our program off with today, uh, and one for you to contemplate throughout this program, which is what does JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, mean to you? And perhaps a more straightforward question to go along with that is, what do you think of when you think of JFK? Perhaps you think of his youthful vigor, at the age of 43, he was our nation's youngest elected president, appearing as he does in the photo here. He represented a younger generation of Americans who would lead and who would lead this country through the early 1960s. Maybe you know some about his accomplishments uh, throughout his presidency, the Peace Corps, the advancement of the space program, and his promise to land a man on the moon, his contributions to civil rights, or his skilled handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
You may also think of his eloquent speeches, his inaugural address in which he famously said, quote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. You may also think about his days spent studying at Harvard University, his heroism in World War II aboard PT-109, his service as a US Senator and as a Congressman. Or you may think of his family, his wife Jacqueline and their children Caroline and John Jr. Or perhaps you think of the tragic day in November in which his life and presidency was ended by an assassin's bullet. At our site, we focus on the early years of his life and influences, particularly when he was a young boy living at 83 Beale Street in Brookline. So although he's perhaps best remembered as the 35th president of the United States, among the other elements of his life and legacy, which we just identified when he lived here, JFK, uh, known to his family at, as Jack, uh, looked a lot like this, the baby on the screen. Born in the second story bedroom of the birthplace home at around 3 p.m. on May 29, 1917, Jack was the second of what would later be a family of nine children. He was the first of three to be born in this house, and he was preceded by his older brother, Joe Jr., who was born in Hull, Massachusetts in 1915. He would be followed by his sister, Rosemary, in 1918, and then Kathleen in 1920. And all four of them would spend time living in what we know today as the JFK birthplace home with their parents. And those parents were the two people who you see in the photo here. Um, this is Joseph Patrick Kennedy Sr., as he later becomes, and Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald Kennedy. They're pictured here on their wedding day on October 7th, 1914. And they were both the grandchildren of Irish Catholic immigrants who came to Boston during the 19th century Great Hunger in Ireland. Joseph Patrick Kennedy Sr. and Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, in this way, were unified in many aspects of their backgrounds and beliefs which would deeply influence their children. They were both also the children of local politicians during the late 19th and early 20th centuries out of the greater Boston area. Uh, for example, Joe Sr.'s father, Patrick, or PJ, as he was known, uh, was both a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives as well as a state senator. And Rose's father, John Francis, or Honey Fitz, as he was known, served as the mayor of Boston, a state senator, and a U.S. congressman. So although it took seven years of courtship before Rose's father approved of the match, Joe Sr. and Rose ultimately married in 1914, shortly thereafter purchasing their first married home at 83 Beale Street in Brookline. In 1914, Brookline was really an up-and-coming streetcar suburb of Boston uh, with its shopping center, newly constructed homes, and access to the city via public transit, some of which you can see here and are similar to the Green Line, uh, which runs through Brookline today. This was a reflection of the couple's own momentum and ambition uh, that they moved to this area um, that was up, up and coming as they began their family together. When they moved into the house, Joe Kennedy was serving as the youngest bank president in the country at the time, and he had a desire to be a millionaire by the time he was 35 years old. As Rose Kennedy recalled in her memoir, quote, most of our young married friends lived in rented apartments, and as a place to start our life together, an apartment would have been perfectly fine for me, but not for Joe. From the very beginning, home was the center of his world, and the only place that really finally counted in his plans, no matter where those plans took him from time to time. He had a strong need for privacy, for independence, for being able to choose the people he wanted to be with in close association. Home could not be an apartment, but it had to be a house. So Mrs. Kennedy herself was ambitious in her own way, um, particularly in her dedication to her children's futures. She was devout in her religious beliefs, her passion for education at home and in school rooted in her own educational background. Um, and she was also familiar with political ambition, as I said earlier, through experiences with her father. The ambitions and expectations of Joe and Rose Kennedy and the legacy of the Kennedy and Fitzgerald families were projected onto their children. Uh, the Bible quote shown here is emblematic of this and is one oft quoted by Rose to her children, stating, for those whom much is given, much shall be expected. 
This expectation was particularly directed at Joe Jr. and Jack, uh, who we see here on Easter Sunday near 83 Beale Street. We believe this photo is from 1920 or 1921, and they're shown here around the ages of five and three respectively. One thing you may notice in looking at this photo is that Jack, younger one there, doesn't look particularly happy in it. In fact, he's sort of grimacing, pointing at his hand, which Joe Jr. seems to be clutching tightly, as if to tell his parents to make Joe Jr. stop. Uh, although perhaps a relatively minor indicator in a photo, this was reflective of how the brothers and later the other siblings were expected to excel and compete uh, really at a high level to achieve success, especially amongst one another. Here, Joe Jr. and Jack are competitive even in the context of simply taking a photograph as kids, but it escalated into their later childhood. But we'll delve a little bit more into all of that during our virtual tour of the home. Once again, shown here. Uh, to give a bit of background on the path of 83 Beale Street from private family home to National Historic Site, it is important to know that Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy recreated the home and furnishings to her memory of its appearance in 1917 when her second son was born. This recreation was done in the wake of her son, second son's assassination in 1963. Mrs. Kennedy sought to provide a window into how she wanted future generations to view the beginnings of President Kennedy's life and family legacy. Uh, donating the restored home to the National Park Service in 1967 and working with the National Park Service to open the site to the public on May 29, 1969, the anniversary of the president's birthday. When I show you photos of the interior of the house and discuss some of the items therein, it is the case that not everything is exactly as it was in 1917, since the recreation was based primarily on Mrs. Kennedy's recollection. The home today is in many ways, therefore, both an idealization as well as an accurate representation of the time when uh, Jack was growing up and had been born in 1917. Mrs. Kennedy's desire, however, to evoke the memory of the early life of the future president and his legacy is very palpable. So if you had come to visit the Kennedys when they lived in this house, you would have been greeted at the door by one of their two servants, Mary O'Donohue or Alice Michelin, whom you can learn a bit more about on our website. We have an article on them. And they would have then led you into the parlor. So the living room or parlor, as it was called in the time, was probably the first room that you would have been brought to when visiting the family. Uh, this room allows us to get a better sense of how the Kennedy family liked to relax, but it also gives subtle clues of Joe and Rose Kennedy's wealth, education, and culture. Mrs. Kennedy was an accomplished musician, and her piano sits in the corner of this room. On the walls, you would see prints of famous works of art that she had seen on her overseas travels and studies in Europe. There are also, as, as is shown on the slide, uh, National Geographic magazines, books, a newspaper, a literary digest, which so, show how the family so valued reading. There are also many family pictures, one of which is shown on the screen here. And this was also the room where the children said their prayers before being sent off to bed at night. And so through their parents, the children were taught to appreciate music, art, literature, travel, history, family, and religion. The Kennedy children were expected to be well-rounded and to strive for excellence in whatever they pursued. The red, sh the red chair shown in the slide here uh, was Joe Kennedy Sr.'s. During the time that they lived in this home, Mr. Kennedy was, as I said earlier, a bank president, and that's the photo shown in uh, the slide here in 1914. He also later co-managed the Four River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts that produced warships and transports for World War I. After the family moved from this home, he became a successful stock market trader, produced Hollywood films, had several political posts under President Franklin D. Roosevelt, and was ultimately U.S. ambassador to Great Britain at the start of World War II. Mr. Kennedy was an affectionate father, and he was respected by his children. He was also very ambitious and drove his children to be the same and extremely competitive. 
He would tell them, quote, that Kennedy's never cry, and he didn't want any losers in the family, only winners. As I mentioned earlier, Rose was the daughter of John Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, a two-term mayor of Boston and the patriarch of the family, shown in the lower right-hand photo on this slide. As a young girl, Rose accompanied her father on his campaigns. She played piano, and he sang to his supporters, earning him that nickname of Honey Fitz for his smooth voice. Rose started campaigning with her father at the young age of five, and so she developed a strong sense of politics and campaigning that would prove very useful later on in her life. Rose excelled in school and was accepted into Wellesley College, but she ended up studying at several convent schools instead. She was fluent in French and German and traveled extensively. In the photo here, she is outside of Windsor Castle in England in 1908. Mrs. Kennedy was intellectually inquisitive and never missed an opportunity to share her knowledge with her children. She later recalled that her daughter Eunice said, quote, it seemed to her that I was always dragging them off to Bunker Hill or Concord Bridge, and there were times when she thought of me as a school teacher. While her children would go off to attend both public and private schools, Mrs. Kennedy never missed an opportunity to educate her children, and this home essentially did become her schoolhouse. So another room on the first floor of the home is, of course, the dining room. That's also an example of how the home became a schoolhouse. Mealtimes presented an opportunity for the entire family to gather, and the Kennedy parents loved to engage their children in discussion. The children were expected to come to meals with ideas and be able to speak up for them. When they were older, Rose Kennedy put up a bulletin board outside of their dining room, and she posted newspaper articles that the children were then expected to read before dinner, and she posted subsequent questions that she wanted them to think about and come prepared to discuss to the dinner table. Joe Kennedy Sr. himself also enjoyed debates, and he would often throw out a topic for discussion in which the children would take sides and argue their points back and forth. The Kennedy parents emphasized, quote, for better or worse, the destiny of the world is shaped by those who get their ideas across. And so this may have been the setting where the future president learned how to think, think critically, express his views, and persuade others. In addition to the role of the dining room in shaping the young Kennedy children, it is important to note that this room contains the most original objects in the home. These include uh, gold-trimmed china painted by Joe Kennedy's sister Margaret, and particularly notably, uh, the silver spoon, bowl, and napkin ring located on the children's table off to the side in the dining room, and that's what's shown on the slide here. Jack, the younger of the two boys, had the smaller porringer bowl, as it was called, and his initials JFK are engraved on the side, and I know it's a bit hard to see. You can see that uh, in the pulled out image on this slide. Among the other original items on display in the dining room are teacups with crossed flags, which were gifts from Sir Thomas Lipton, owner of the Lipton Tea Company. These were mementos of a visit Honey Fitz, Rose, and her sister Agnes made to the tea magnate's ship named the Erin in honor of uh, his own Irish heritage. In later years, Kennedy teas became an important political tactic among the family. In 1952, when JFK was then running for the Senate, his mother and sisters hosted 33 political tea parties, one of which is shown in the photo on the slide here. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy is speaking while JFK and other family members look on. These campaign events attracted scores of women who were eager to meet the candidate and his family. And interestingly, it was the female vote that played a major role in the election in which JFK won. His opponent at the time, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., would later say that it was because of those tea parties that JFK beat him. When a Kennedy family member ran for political office, the entire family became involved and their campaign successes ultimately became very legendary. So as you proceed to the second floor of the home, you come to Joe and Rose Kennedy's bedroom, which is also where John F. Kennedy was born, as I said earlier, on May 29th of 1917, and that would have been in the bed closest to the window. Children were often born at home in the early 1900s, and the bed closest to the window was chosen because that way, if the baby were born in the daytime, the doctor would have more light to work with. If you notice, there is a small clock between the beds, more well-defined in the separate photo on the slide, 
And you can see that JFK was born at three o'clock in the afternoon, and all of the clocks in the house are in fact set to 3 p.m. to reflect the hour of his birth. Mrs. Kennedy said in her memoirs, quote, I looked on child rearing not only as a work of love and duty, but as a profession that was fully as interesting and challenging as any honorable profession in the world, and one that demanded the best that I could bring to it. She took her role as mother very seriously and was very invested in the lives of all of her children. Mrs. Kennedy was also very pious and a devout Catholic, and she often attended church every day, bringing the children with her. Despite this, you see very few religious items in the home. However, above the beds, you see two religious paintings, one of which is highlighted here. And this was because Mrs. Kennedy said that she felt that church was a place to worship and home was a place for family. And so she didn't want a lot of religious items in the house. In the early 1900s in Boston, many Irish Catholics faced discrimination. And years later, when in 1960, JFK ran for president, the issue of his Catholic faith was his greatest challenge in many ways. He addressed voter concerns early on, identified the need for separation of church and state, and ultimately successfully became the nation's first Irish Catholic president. Similar to his wife's belief that home was a place for family, Joe Kennedy preferred not to work from home. In this room, you see a telephone between the two beds and another downstairs by the dining room. That was the front entry hall uh, slide that was the first in this home tour. It was unusual for families to have two phones in 1917. However, when Mr. Kennedy was co-managing the Four River Shipyard, it was a facility that ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week during the war. And so Mr. Kennedy wanted easy access to communication if work required his attention. He would later say that he worked harder at the Four River Shipyard than ever before in his life. Despite his long days at work, when Mr. Kennedy was home, he reserved time for each of his children. He would often invite them into his room individually and speak with each child about what was going on in his or her life. Now the pictures at the far end of the room, um, and you may have noticed them, they were left of the window in that bedroom. Those are uh, a series of photos of the four Kennedy children who lived in this home. So once again, that's Joe Jr., Jack, Rosemary, and Kathleen, also known as Kick. Uh, and Kick and Rosemary were also born in the parents' bedroom. Kathleen's effervescent personality as a child earned her the nickname Kick. She was particularly close with her older brother Jack growing up as the two were similarly more mischievous and free-spirited. And you can learn a little bit more about Kick in a soon-to-be-published article that we'll have up on our website that one of our staff wrote. And I'll speak a little bit more about Joe Jr. later, um, but just in the interest of highlighting the sisters, um, I do want to take some time to talk about Rosemary. Now, Rosemary, the eldest daughter, did develop more slowly than her siblings. And here's some quotations from uh, Mrs. Kennedy, Rose Kennedy, describing this a little bit in her memoir. Rosemary took longer to walk and talk and struggled with reading. Um, but despite the adversity of struggling to learn skills, she watched her siblings complete with ease. Rosemary was remembered as a cheerful and affectionate child, eager to please and determined to live up to her family's standards. She was included in all the same activities as her siblings, adjusted as needed and with accommodations. And she was especially close to her younger sister, Eunice. This closeness was maintained into young adulthood and beyond, including following a devastating lobotomy Rosemary underwent upon the, medical, uh, upon the advice of medical professionals to correct mood swings and convulsions. And this ultimately, unfortunately, left her without most of her faculties after the age of 23. Mrs. Kennedy said in her memoirs that, quote, her children's compassion for the underprivileged probably came from their helping their sister Rosemary with the smallest of victories. President Kennedy was the first president to sign major legislation for those with disabilities, but it also became a big Kennedy family effort. Eunice, who was so close to Rosemary, founded the Special Olympics, uh, Sister Jean, a program called Very Special Arts, and Mrs. Kennedy went on television talk shows raising funds and awareness, and ultimately the Kennedy Foundation also donated money towards these efforts. And similar to uh, Kathleen, um, we do have a separate article on our website that speaks a bit more about Rosemary and her life. So the next room on the second floor of the house, which I'd like to highlight, is the nursery. Uh, Jack shared the nursery with his brother, Joe Jr., 
At his young age, when living in the Beale Street home, Jack used the bassinet, which you can see in this photo. And that was something that was used by all of the other Kennedy siblings, as well as JFK's own children, Caroline and John Jr. The boys, Joe Jr. and Jack, were close to one another, but like most siblings, were also very competitive. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the Kennedy parents encouraged high-spirited competition within the family, and this was certainly no exception uh, between Joe Jr. and Jack. And so significant were Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy's expectations of their children that early on, they wanted one of them to become president. Interestingly, at the time, it was their firstborn son, uh, Joe Jr., who they had in mind. Uh, Joe did well in school, had an early love of history and politics, and essentially listened to most of what his parents told him to do. By contrast, Jack was smart, but didn't always try his best in school. And living in his brother's shadow, Jack often got into mischief and pulled practical jokes as a way of getting his parents' attention. That was often his way of standing out in what was a very large family. When Joe Jr. unfortunately lost his life during World War II, these weighty expectations fell to Jack, who over time more gracefully recognized the goal for the presidency as his own. Now, Jack did spend a lot of time in this room in the nursery because he was often ill as a small child, and he did remain plagued by health issues throughout much of his life. Due to these ailments, he had several close encounters with death. This may have resulted in a certain toughness of character and also a special zest for life. One of his campaign advisors, Chuck Spaulding, later recalled, quote, for those around him, Jack's intensity was contagious, transforming ordinary events into special occasions. Whenever he was in a situation, he tried to burn bright. He tried to wring as much out of things as he could. After a while, he didn't have to try. He had something nobody else did. It was just a heightened sense of being. There's really no other way to describe it. As a child, when Jack was sick and recovering in this room, he enjoyed having books read to him. Books allowed him to engage his imagination and his desire to travel. He loved reading so much that over time he became a speed reader and wrote several books of his own. Two of his favorite childhood books, however, are on display in this room, uh, King Arthur and His Knights and Billy Whiskers Kids, which the latter of that is the one that's pulled out in this slide. King Arthur was a book Mrs. Kennedy really liked, a story about knights and chivalry performing heroic deeds and full of many of the same types of values that she was trying to instill in young Jack. Billy Whiskers, however, is a book of which she disapproved. Uh, the story about a mischievous goat uh, she felt was one that the boys didn't necessarily need as they were getting into enough trouble on their own without being inspired by Billy Whiskers. Uh, one anecdote tells of how in the window of a restaurant on Harvard Street, so near Coolidge Corner, with a sign outside that read, no dogs allowed, Jack and Joe changed it to read, no hot dogs allowed. And this was just one of the many sort of mischievous activities that the two brothers got up to growing up in Brookline. This was indicative of a certain mischievousness as a child and sense of humor as an adult that translated into charm and charisma for Jack. As president, he became the first to start regularly scheduled televised press conferences. He used his humor, charm, wit, and youthful appearance uh, to win over his audiences. So we'll just pause briefly um, so you can get a sense of what the guest room in the home looks like. Um, once the sisters were born, the boys moved into what was in 1917, um, the recreation of this home um, this time period. Uh, they would have moved to the guest room down the hall, um, and that's what's seen in the photo here. Among the highlights in this space are a grooming set, which belonged to Rosemary Kennedy, and that's engraved with her initials RMK. All right. So another notable room on the second floor of the home is the boudoir. Uh, in which you might observe Rose Kennedy's darning bulb and sewing kit on the table. There's a picture of her father on the desk holding her firstborn son, Joe Jr. And there's pictures of her husband, Joe Sr. as well. This space was essentially uh, Mrs. Kennedy's office. She said that Mr. Kennedy had his office in Boston and that as manager of this house, she wanted her office in the home. So 
there's a wooden box atop her desk, and it was within this box that Rose Kennedy kept meticulous note cards on which she recorded the children's health, their height and weight by week, and many other details. You can see Jack's full health card here, um, very full in terms of the amount of subject matter that's on it, and that's indicative of uh, his previously mentioned childhood ailments and future battle with chronic illness, in particular Addison's disease, which was discovered later in his life. Mrs. Kennedy was very regimented and methodical. She had a lot of rules in her house and believed in something called scientific mothering. Having read many books on how to raise children under a strict regimen, she bought into many of these ideas wholeheartedly. Uh, for example, Rose Kennedy lined up the children in order of their height before they brushed their teeth each night. The bath water was set at an exact temperature for a child based on his or her age. And there was also an exact number of hugs that she believed children should receive daily. Jack's rebellious streak as a child manifested in his being late to strict meal times that were also part of this regimen, often arriving only in time for dessert, which was his preferred part of the meal. So the final stop on our in-person tours of the home at 83 Beale Street are generally in the kitchen. So that's a return to the first floor of the house. Mrs. Kennedy remembered that she often found Jack in the kitchens after meals receiving extra food from the cooks. She was very strict about meal times, as you may have uh, gleaned from the earlier slide and discussion, and she didn't allow her other children to do this. However, with Jack often being ill and underweight, she didn't mind him necessarily getting these extra bits of food as a way of keeping some weight on him and, and keeping his health um, as good as it could be. In the kitchen, you can see that the Kennedy family enjoyed many of the basic comforts that we enjoy today. Uh, an icebox refrigerator, radiator heat, hot and cold running water, electricity, and electric lighting. It was certainly a comfortable home for the newlyweds as well as their family. Now, when Mrs. Kennedy returned to this house to restore it, she made audio recordings that she wanted visitors to hear as they explored her family's home. And you can still have the opportunity to do this uh, in person if you come to visit us at the site, um, or you can actually also find it on our website if you're interested in listening to uh, Rose Kennedy's narration of the home. In this room, she remembers looking out the windows to see the children in the warm spring sun and building snowmen in the winter. She also said that she was, as it shows in the quote here, very happy when she lived here. And although the family did not know about the days ahead, they were enthusiastic and optimistic about the future. Mrs. Kennedy had many reasons for which to be happy when she lived here. Uh, she was a newlywed. She had four of her children while living in this home and things were going well for Mr. Kennedy financially. And the family was indeed becoming wealthier as well as growing in size. And that leads us to uh, a bit of a tour of the neighborhood. So sort of looking out beyond the house, 83 Beale Street, the birthplace home, which is John Fitzgerald Kennedy National Historic Site. There are a lot of highlights within this Coolidge Corner neighborhood in Brookline um, that are significant elements of the Kennedy family story um, and the evolution of uh, Jack to ultimately become President Kennedy. So the first location I'll discuss on this neighborhood tour um, is their second home, the family's second home at 51 Abbotsford Road in Brookline. So as I said earlier, Jack's relationship with his family was truly invaluable to him. And particularly that was the case in regards to early competition with his brother, Joe Jr., and the influence of ambition and progress, which came from both of his parents. And progress the family did, uh, particularly, as I said, Joe Kennedy Sr.'s fortunes became more significant as their family grew encouraging Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy to upgrade in the size of their home while remaining connected to the Brookline community that they so valued. Um, you can see here their upgraded second home, which is a few blocks away from 83 Beale Street. And as I said, it's at 51 Abbotsford Road. Rose Kennedy, who anticipated a larger family and would soon be pregnant with Eunice, was particularly pleased with this home when the family moved in in 1920. And she and Joe would go on to also have Patricia and Bobby here. Among those things which Rose loved so much was the large wraparound porch, which she would use as an outdoor playpen area for the children, where they each had a designated space, but could also interact with each other as well as interact with passers-by. 
With the arrival of more siblings in his life, Jack's personality evolved during the ages of around three to 10 when he lived in this home. Uh, in addition to the significant competitiveness Jack experienced with older brother Joe Jr., the relationships he had with his younger siblings in particular brought out both his more mischievous side and his more protective sides. And those are sort of both shown in the photo taken in front of the garage of the home. And that's the photo that's shown in the slide here. You can see Jack making a bit of a funny face, um, but while also being um, sort of overseeing his younger sisters. In addition to this mischievous side, Jack had his particular and distinctive caring side, and that came again with his family. Um, this was very evident in particular in his relationship with his immediately younger sister, Rosemary, who you can see in this photo uh, and who I spoke a bit more about earlier. Now, another uh, essential location within the Brookline community for the Kennedy family was St. Aidan's Roman Catholic Church, and that was a few blocks away from both the Beale Street and Abbotsford Road homes when the family lived in Brookline. Rose Kennedy and the Kennedy children made the journey from their home to this church most, if not all, days of the week. Mrs. Kennedy wanted her children to know that, quote, church was for every day, not just for Sundays. And that's an indication of her own piety and religious faith, which she wanted to ensure was a tenant of her children's lives. From an early age into adulthood, Rose Kennedy was even formally recognized for her piety by the Roman Catholic Church, first as a child of Mary in her youth, and later as one of only six women from the United States to be named a papal countess. This devotion was part of what led her to place high importance in a community such as Brookline, where she could regularly bring her children to church. Although as a child, Jack may not have taken religious devotion as seriously as his mother, he did carry out regular religious observances throughout his youth, and this church was really a key part of that. Um, for example, he was baptized here, and in fact, his baptismal gown, uh, or christening gown as it's called, um, also worn by all of his siblings, as well as his children, Caroline and John Jr., is temporarily on loan um, from our site uh, to the JFK Library and Museum. Um, so if you're interested in seeing it live and in person, um, it is available for you to do so there at this time. And so as I stated earlier, his uh, Catholic religion became notable during his campaign and election to the presidency, as he was the first of two Catholic presidents, and that set a precedent to a degree for diversity and acceptance in the White House. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the importance of education to the Kennedy family and to later President Kennedy as an adult in particular cannot be overstated. Um, this was not only the case in the home, but of course also at formal school. Um, then known as the Edward Devotion School, this school on the slide, uh, was where Jack received his first formal education. It was a public school, as Mrs. Kennedy felt strongly that their children should have interactions with a broad cross-section of individuals during their formative years. Uh, today, it is known as the Florida Ruff and Ridley School, named for an African-American suffragist from Boston. Now, JFK had a lifelong love of learning, beginning even prior to his formal education and fostered at home. As a student in school, however, as I alluded to earlier, Jack was not necessarily one to focus on or thrive in those subjects in which he was disinterested, instead largely earning better grades in English and history. In spite of his mischievous nature and disinclination towards his schoolwork, uh, teachers at the devotion school remembered him fondly. Upon his publication of Why England Slept, uh, which was his Harvard under University undergraduate thesis, one of Jack's former teachers, Mrs. Roberts of the devotion school, reached out to Jack to congratulate him on the success of his newly published book, writing, quote, I wish now to congratulate little Jackie Kennedy of Devotion School Brookline. I must confess, I am very proud of your success. I am sure we can expect great things from you, Jackie. So a community and national recognition for President Kennedy's birthplace home at 83 Beale Street uh, predated his assassination. Once he was elected president, the town of Brookline decided to memorialize his birthplace. In 1961, they erected a marker commemorating his birth on a tablet in front of the house, and that's what's shown on the lower left side of the slide here. The house drew curious citizens, some of whom even knocked on the door. Sometimes, owner Martha Pollock let them in and showed the bedroom where the president was born. 
President Kennedy himself recognized the significance of his birthplace just months before his death following a trip he had made to Ireland in a letter he then wrote to Mrs. Pollock. He said, quote, there's within each man a very special affection for the place of his birth. And I am deeply pleased to know that you are living a full and enjoyable life at my birthplace. The birthplace home became a focal point for mourning following President Kennedy's November 22nd, 1963 assassination as is indicated in this photo taken of Beale Street just, just days later, and that's in the upper left-hand uh, corner. It was not necessarily um, uh, spontaneous. Uh, it had been a pre-planned gathering, but the sheer number of people uh, who attended this morning ceremony, ceremony um, was incredibly impactful and not necessarily expected. For Rose Kennedy, whose life was marred by tragedy with her original four children who lived in this home having already met tragic fates when she returned and her son Bobby assassinated halfway through the home's restoration. Uh, her work on this home was able to evoke for her what she felt was a simpler, happier time. The Kennedy family did become one of America's wealthiest families and this allowed for an array of extraordinary experiences. And they did ultimately leave Brookline in 1927. Uh, the family would move first to um, Riverdale, New York, and then a year later to Bronxville, New York um, in 1928. Um, and that would be around the same time that the family purchased the compound uh, in Hyannisport, as it's known today. So they still remained tied to Massachusetts um, following their departure from living more permanently in the state. Despite their wealth, uh, Mrs. Kennedy often quoted from the Bible, as I said earlier, telling her children, quote, to whom much is given, much is to be expected. And so the children were taught from an early age to appreciate their good fortune and to give back very essentially. Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy wielded significant influence over their children, and this ultimately resulted in two World War II military heroes, a congressman, three senators, an attorney general, two Presidential Medal of Freedom winners, an ambassador, and of course, president. It's sort of amazing to think that 83 Beale Street is where John F. Kennedy took his first steps and that those steps would one day lead him to the White House and ultimately into that highest office of the land. John F. Kennedy's relationships with his parents and his siblings, as well as the influences of growing up in Brookline during his formative years, were extremely influential upon aspects of his character and these experiences have parallels in his adult life, as I spoke a bit about, and ultimately as president of the United States. He was a president who inspired an entire generation of people in the 1960s, and he is still recognized for his ideals and as an inspiration for many people today. So I, uh, at this point, do want to thank you so much for your time and attention today. As it indicates on the slide here, we do have some resources available through our website. Um, that's the www.nps.gov slash Joffe um, web address there. Uh, we also do, as it indicates on the slide here, have some resources available through our website. Um, and that's including um, uh, information regarding ongoing restoration and renovation work to the Home and Visitor Center, um, which includes the addition of an accessibility lift for access to our visitor center. Uh, we currently anticipate reopening this summer, and it's optimistically projected to be sometime in early July, so please keep an eye on our website and social media, which is also listed here, um, for any updates regarding this. So, as I said before, I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I'll turn it back over to um, Robert, who can take a look at some of the questions and let me know what we have. Yeah, so Gabby, wonderful job as expected. Uh, let's give Gabby a big virtual round of applause. And folks, we have uh, roughly uh, 10 minutes of questions or so. Um, so let's see here. Michelle wants to know, what would happen to Jack when he was late for dinner? Would there be any sort of punishment? Yeah, so my understanding of it is that um, typically he may be denied dessert later on at another future meal. Sometimes he may just not be allowed to have dessert um, at all, even though he arrived at that time um, to have what he wanted, or there would be an expectation that he would, you know, 
be forced to have his meal as he uh, needed to have it beforehand the next time he had his meal, but he might not be allowed to have dessert, something along those lines. So it's a little bit interesting to me that Rose was, you know, very regimented about that and very not okay with him arriving late to meals, but was still understanding of him getting extra food later on in the kitchens. Um, but yeah, that's, I imagine, sort of maybe a, a, a punishment of not having dessert after the next time they have a meal together, um, since that was his favorite part of the meal. <laughs> uh, Marjorie says that this was wonderful. Donna says fabulous presentation. Thank you. Uh, Wendy has a good question. Wendy wants to know, was there an Irish enclave in Brookline? Why didn't the Kennedys live in Boston near their own parents? Yeah, so as far as I know, Brookline was um, relatively diverse for the time. Um, at the time, um, for example, there was a, a synagogue that opened around the time that the Kennedys lived there. That's just at the top of Beale Street. Um, that's still there today. Um, in terms of an Irish enclave, there wasn't anything super significant. There was enough of a Catholic enclave to have St. Aidan's Church um, at the time, and that was what was essential for Rose. But the main impetus behind them choosing not to live in Boston near their family is because they wanted to have the opportunity to buy a home. Um, sort of similar to today, I guess you could say it wasn't necessarily affordable to buy a house um, in Boston proper. And it was also really something that, um, in addition to having to rent an apartment, I think that Joe Sr. felt that he wanted his family to be known not just for their their ethnic heritage. Um, he wanted them to have an opportunity to to live outside of that as well, um, not to fall into what he perceived to be sort of this Irish stereotype that we were talking about existed in Boston in the early 1900s. So um, that was something that he carried with Joe Senior. That is carried with him through a lot of his life. He really felt like he had been. Um, slighted because of his ethnic background as an Irish Catholic. Um, and there's some allusion in what he, um, in his writings to the fact that they even moved from Massachusetts to New York because of that, that they wanted to sort of escape that um, presumption of the type of people that they were because of their Irish heritage. So I think also, in addition to the desire to just have a space of their own, have more property at the time, um, because even though that area of Beale Street is quite built up today, um, they were actually the last house on the block at the time and they had their whole yard. It was also an element of trying to move away from um, sort of what was almost expected of them um, and be remaining in an enclave of an Irish Catholic community in Boston proper. Uh, Susan asks, did the owner after the Kennedys donate the house to the National Park Service or was it purchased? So it was purchased. Um, it was purchased. Originally, the town of Brookline tried to purchase the home um, following um, President Kennedy's assassination, but they were unsuccessful in doing so. And it's at that time that Rose Kennedy stepped in and she actually did purchase the home. Um, as we alluded to, the family had become quite wealthy um, by certainly the late 19, mid, mid to late 1960s, um, and they were able to afford to purchase the home. And then it was through Rose's efforts, um, in addition to uh, an interior designer who she worked with, Robert Luddington, um, that they were able to restore it. And then in 1967, following the restoration work, but before it opened to the public, she actually donated it to the National Park Service. So there was a trajectory of purchase from um, Martha Pollock, the woman who lived in the home and owned the home at the time. Um, you know, Rose Kennedy was sort of the intermediary between Martha Pollock and the National Park Service. So um, it was uh, donated by Rose Kennedy, but it was purchased by her um, from the uh, previous owner, Martha Pollock. And uh, that also answers uh, most of Mary's question. Uh, Mary also asks, how much money was paid for, uh, I guess, how much money did the house cost uh, when it was purchased in 1914? That's a great question. I actually do not know off the top of my head. I, I feel like I did look this up relatively recently and it was a pretty you know, low price from what you would think. Um, I want to say it was in the single thousands of dollars, but I can definitely, if um, you have my email, feel free to to email me and ask because I, I don't want to just make up a number. I do. I've seen it before, but I just can't remember off the top of my head right now. I'm so sorry. No, 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 no worries. Uh, you know, in 2023 dollars, when we adjust for inflation, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, it'll you know, be a significant it, difference. It's I think so. 
Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, are any of uh, John F. Kennedy's other homes available for public tours? So as far as I know, they are not. Um, I do know that um, in Hyannis, uh, near Hyannis Port, which is where the Kennedy compound as it's sort of um, colloquially known today, there is a um, affiliate museum for the JFK Library and Museum, which is, um, uh, you know, near Dorchester and Boston today. Um, there is a small museum there. I don't know if they have a relationship with the family members who are at the Hyannisport compound to the extent that there's open houses or something like that. As, as far as I know, there's probably not, but there is a museum down there. Um, but I do think, I do think obviously, you know, other than taking tours of the White House, um, we're probably the only Kennedy family home um, that, you know, still exists and is open to the public. For example, 51 Abbotsford Road is a private residence today. Um, the, the folks who live there are very kind and, uh, you know, are fine with us bringing tour groups by the house. Um, but it is a private residence. So, so we are really the only public facing um, space in Brookline. Uh, Michelle says, very touching and meaningful. I've never remotely felt any kind of feeling or connection to any president since JFK. Thank Kathy you. says, excellent presentation. Suzanne really enjoyed it. Frances said it was very interesting and she learned uh, quite a bit. Uh, Joyce would like to know, uh, does your site uh, do any sort of program coordination with the JFK Presidential Library and Museum? Yeah, so we do. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, we do currently have some of our uh, collections items on loan to the JFK Library and Museum. Um, that includes the christening gown that I mentioned and also um, what I showed in the presentation, that silver spoon, napkin ring, and bowl that are engraved with JFK um, that are on display typically in our dining room. Um, as the home has been undergoing renovation and restoration work, the library has generously um, taken those, or the museum, I should say, has taken those and displayed them. Um, so periodically, uh, in particular this past summer, we as our staff did go over and offered, um, you know, informal talks, I guess you would call them, right by that exhibit space, which is really great. Um, I was also recently over there for President's Day for the same thing. Um, and we do coordinate with one another for a few other projects um, or programs that we work together on. For example, the Florida Ruff and Ridley School, previously the Devotion School, uh, that is a school where we do a program every year with all the third graders in that school, um, where they have to write poems and essays based on the theme, What JFK Means to Me. Um, and they work with both us as well as the JFK Library and Museum. So it's sort of a mutual relationship um, in that sense, so. Uh, you just referenced uh, renovations and restorations. Uh, Gail uh, would like to know uh, what exactly is being renovated right now? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a lot. Um, I will be honest and say that it's been going on, I believe, since 2019. And then given the pandemic, um, we've unfortunately been closed since then, but it is as a result of the work having to be delayed as a result of the pandemic. Um, but as I said, we're aspirationally going to be open um, this summer. Um, They've been doing, in terms of the exterior, it's it's really everything and anything. Um, there's repainting of the exterior. Um, there's redoing some of the some of the shingle siding, um, stabilizing. There's, I don't have a picture of it up here, but you can, might be able to tell that there is a balcony on the, um, yep, there it is, a balcony and the porch that are on the front of the home. Um, those were being restabilized. Um, the interior, um, the uh, wallpaper is being cleaned and it's being repainted, you know, to the traditional color, but just a fresh coat of paint. And probably the most um, significant thing is that our visitor center, which is in the basement of the home, um, that's the available space for our visitor center, um, is getting a complete facelift uh, to a certain degree, um, where you have the addition of uh, an addition, another restroom, um, which is great, obviously, for visitation and for staff, um, and also um, just trying to maximize our space. We're working on new, new permanent exhibits right now. Um, and then finally, one of the key things is the accessibility component. We did add a wheelchair lift, um, which can bring visitors now um, into uh, the visitor center, which is great. Unfortunately, we didn't have that accessibility previously. So, so yeah, it's a lot of things. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, our website for, before, we do um, have an article there currently that has some photos of the work that's been going on if you're interested. Wonderful. So uh, Gabby, we're going to start to wrap it up. There was about a dozen or so folks who had questions for Gabby uh, that we did not have time to answer. 
Uh, I'm putting Gabby's email address in the chat. I'll also include it uh, in the email that I, I send out to everyone with the uh, recording and the feedback survey. Uh, Gabby, I'll circle back to you in a moment uh, for any last words. Uh, but folks, I want to thank you all so much for coming. Look for an email from me later today with a link to a recording, link to a feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming uh, virtual programs. Uh, also, in that email, I will thank uh, by name all the libraries that helped uh, promote uh, today's talk. So, Gabby, do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap it up? Uh, no more than to essentially say what I said before, which is just thank you to everyone um, so much for your time. I really appreciate being invited to participate in this series by the Tuxbury Public Library. Um, and as Robert said, my, my email address is there and I happily welcome any questions. So I look forward to hearing from you. Great. Wonderful job, Gabby, uh, you know, as expected. Uh, and uh, folks, I uh, look for that email in the next uh, hour or two. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day and we'll see you virtually, uh, hopefully uh, fairly soon. So thanks so much. Thanks again, Gabby. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.